that. Okay. Oh, there we go. Hold on. All right, there we go, Charity. The floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, sorry, I'm joining by phone today, not my computer audio. So um, thanks for putting this uh, webinar together about pulling virtual tours together quickly. And thanks to all of you who've joined us today. I'm sure, like myself, you're interested to see um, lots of different options and ideas from Time Looper. Um, I wanted to say a few words before we get started. Um, first, we recognize, Andrew and I both do, that many of you are still working to address uh, the health and well being of staff and visitors and figuring out how to just accomplish immediate tasks in, in many cases from home. Um, it's we're just a couple weeks into closures and we realize you may not be quite yet uh, doing this work or but uh, it may just be interested in the work um, but we wanted to go ahead and get this out here as soon as we could um, to help you plan um, we're also not suggesting with this webinar that museums should feel the pressure to add content like this right now um, there's still time in um, you know many cases that cases that i'm aware of at least already in the midwest uh, virtual tours that, that have been popping up or 360 videos and things like that. Many of those things were already in progress for museums. They may have started on them months ago. Um, don't think that everybody's turning this out overnight. Um, they're not. They're likely, you know, trying to uh, accomplish tasks that they'd already set for themselves this year. And so there, there's some thought process that's already been in place. Um, there are also things that you can be doing in the interim um, beyond uh, producing virtual tours and, and 360 videos that Andrew's going to talk about today. You know, staying in touch with your visitors and your members and stakeholders is very important right now. However you may do it, uh, that can be on social media and e-blasts and other things that you may already be doing, and that's wonderful. Keep doing that. Um, I want to encourage you to just consider all your options. Um, but don't feel the pressure from us with this webinar to do anything um, that you're not quite prepared to do yet. Uh, but that's to say that there's still time and you'll uh, be able to work on things like this uh, during closures and beyond. Um, I appreciate Time Looper and Andrew putting together this presentation and, and sharing, you know, different sort of paths for museums who are considering this. Um, and I look forward to hearing the presentation and hope that um, everyone else is excited too. Um, Andrew, I think that's all I really wanted to cover. Uh, thanks again, and I'll let you take it from here. Wonderful, thank you. A couple of housekeeping notes, the first of which is we only have about, we've designed this to be about 40 minutes. Um, therefore, if you have questions, please click the Q&A tab on the, the black control bar. Uh, on your Zoom screen and feel free to ask them. We will attempt to answer those questions as they arise in the context of the particular part of the conversation that we're addressing. If the questions become um, overwhelming, we will likely have to um, defer uh, answering particular questions until the end to ensure that we can get through all of the content. Also, while we've designed this to be an hour, if there are more questions, Yeet and I are prepared to stay on as long as uh, is required to answer everybody's questions. So our goal is to answer everybody's question, or if we cannot answer them, at least tell you that we're going to track down the answers uh, and then follow up with you after the fact. Additionally, we are going to share both the presentation itself and the recording of this webinar with Charity. Uh, and all of those resources she will hopefully post on the uh, AMM resource boards uh, on uh, the AMM channels. And then we're also going to post these resources on the Time Looper channel. So don't get uh, bogged down in worrying about taking notes. Also at the back of this presentation is a full resource page with links to a host of free resources and products that we like um, that you can uh, refer to. Uh, again, so don't get caught up uh, worrying about writing down the specific names of specific products, et cetera. It's all here. It's all available for you. We just want to make it so that you can be present in the next hour and not worry about having to track these things down after the fact. Uh, so without that, oh, sorry, so without further ado, uh, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, there are two uh, of us 
uh, facilitating this webinar for Time Looper today. There's myself, Andrew Feinberg. Uh, I met several of you at the uh, conference in Grand Rapids uh, in 2019, and I'm joined by my fellow principal and colleague, Yi Eater, who was not with me. You're going to be hearing from the two of us today. We have both been at Time Looper uh, since its founding six years ago uh, and worked to develop uh, new immersive technologies to suit all of your needs uh, as the museum industry adapts to new technologies uh, and uh, new customer expectations. Before we dive into the uh, nuts and bolts, I also just want to mention one last thing, which is we're going to be talking about a range of products today. Our goal is to provide you with some best practices or tips that we have seen that can help you get a uh, basic virtual experience that is engaging online in relatively short order uh, because time is relatively of the essence here where people are stuck in their homes and many of our partner institutions around the country have been caught flat footed. Um, and so all of the tools that you see here are free or uh, they are at consumer cost, um, meaning these are not professional pieces of hardware or publishing platforms that are very expensive. Um, and they're all designed to be able to help you very quickly. So now that we're gonna jump in and talk about how to get your VR tour stood up online quickly, uh, I think that it would be helpful to level set on what VR is. Um, and there are two principal methods through which virtual reality can be uh, built. Um, but at its core, virtual reality is really about enabling people to immerse themselves in an environment that is other than their own. So if I'm on my couch at home and I'm trying not to strangle my children and I'm trying to keep them actively engaged, it's about taking them out of our living room where we are social distancing from everybody but each other, unfortunately, and putting them someplace else. That place could be your museum. That place could be 200,000 years ago, or it could be 100 years into the future. The main thing to consider here, as uh, definitionally when we're talking about VR today, is that it, it's really just putting people in a different environment. There are much more advanced definitions out there, but for all intents and purposes, I'm not sure how useful they are. And there are two ways to enable that or to facilitate that level of immersion. The first of which is if the place that you want to immerse people outside of their current environment exists today, the most common way of doing that is through taking 360 degree photos, 360 degree videos, or even scanning the present day environment and then putting that, making that available for people to move through. So again, to refer to the use case that I just uh, referred to, if you wanted to put people in your museum or in your historic site or in your public land or in your zoo as it looks today, it's as simple as taking 360 degree photos, videos, scans, and uploading them. If you are uh, a little bit more adventuresome or you have uh, more ambitious interpretation goals and you wanna show people the potential impacts of climate change 100 years from now, or if you wanna take people back to the Cretaceous period, or you wanna take people uh, back to meet George Washington on the day of his inauguration, obviously those visual environments no longer exist or do not exist yet. And so taking a photo or a video or a scan of that world as it looks would be, uh, it is impossible. It would be ineffective. You couldn't put people in that environment. So in that regard, you would have to develop what we call computer-generated imagery, and it's an interpretation, CGI. So again, one is present-day photo video capture, and the other of which is computer-generated imagery. I'm now going to pass it off to Yeet, um, who's going to show you examples of both of these two virtual um, production uh, approaches, because for those of you who've never experienced VR, we think it will be a very helpful level set before we proceed into talking about how to actually develop these interpretive technologies. So Yeet, I'm now gonna pass it to you. So now I'm joining this call from my iPad and I'm going to share my screen. After I share my screen, I'm going to turn around myself, around myself and then my screen, the, what I'm looking at will change. So it's a 360 degrees view. As I uh, turn the view here, as you can see, it's hard to see, but it will also move. So now let's start sharing my screen. <clears throat> 
So now I am in my in the VR experience, and I am looking around. I'm turning around myself. Um, so this is the view from the top of Washington Monument. This is a project that we did with National Park Service at the National Mall, and um, the project started as. Um, the Washington Monument was closed for and it stayed closed for three years. And then during that time, National Park Service interpretation team wanted to show the view from the top for the people who cannot go up uh, from anywhere around the world, actually. And um, this is what we are looking at is present day picture of the environment. So then they also uh, we also created interpretive layers. And then what I'm going to show you next is a computer generated content. So now we are going to see DC in 1800s. That's their, that will, that's their interpretation goal from the top of the monument to show the, uh, the change in landscapes over time. So now we have seen two examples. One is computer generated. The other one is uh, uh, present day photo capture and 360. Thank you, Yeet. Okay. Um, so I think that one of the things that is uh, worth considering when, um, when looking at those two experiences is, is pausing to, to consider the question, you know, not just what is VR, but, but why it matters. And in both of those instances, the present day and in the digital, uh, uh, the, digital uh, the CGI recreation, um, it was really about not only enabling you to see the environment, but also understanding the contextu contextualizing that visual experience and answering the so what, why it matters. This, this particular experience uh, wasn't just about showing people the top of Washington as it looked, but then they also wanted to take that opportunity to help people understand the impact uh, of human-based decision-making in shaping the physical environment of Washington, D.C., in highlighting that the Tidal Basin um, and the Potomac River um, and the National Mall are all features that were dramatically impacted by individuals who reshaped the land. So when you think about the power of VR within your institution, and your head is probably immediately going to places within your institution where you would like to capture 360 photo or video, it's useful to also think about why would the user at home care to visualize that perspective, that particular point of view, and then how can you enhance or highlight the meaning of uh, or relevance of that particular location? Uh, the the last thing that I'll mention with regards to definitionally what is VR is to realize that there are uh, many many. Um, people out there who espouse the view that for VR to be impactful, you need a high-end headset. Well, that is not the case. He showed you really immersive experiences from his tablet. Everybody uh, at home today, uh, virtually everybody, has access to a tablet device, a smartphone, a desktop computer. All of those devices will enable people to move through your institution, to have a deeper appreciation of its visual beauty, uh, its relevance, the context around it. Don't get hung up in worrying about what types of devices people have. All of the platforms that we're gonna be showing you today are designed to reach people where they are. It would obviously be great if everybody in their home had the highest end immersive technology, but we can't let the enemy be, uh, we cannot let uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. The uh, the hardware out there today is perfectly suitable for facilitating uh, immersive uh, experiences uh, and interpretive uh, knowledge transmission. And so uh, you should all embrace those. the fact that those pieces of hardware are out there because what it does is it actually dramatically lowers uh, your, your community's, uh, you know, cost of entry or uh, it removes a sticking point. So now that we've sort of aligned on what VR is, we want to start talking about the very basic building blocks of how to develop and subsequently publish all of these different pieces of content. So what we have here is two basic pieces, uh, two basic approaches that likely all of you will want to take if you have not deployed uh, immersive uh, VR within your institution. One of which is a 360 degree picture and the other of which is a 360 degree video. 
In both of these instances, your user is anchored to a uh, particular, is likely to be anchored to a particular point of view, uh, um, you know, the center of a radius. So in a photo or in a video, they cannot move within that environment. Um, and the, the, the use case of these two different uh, approaches is that a 360 picture is really about uh, centering the user experience on visualizing a space. So if it's a public land or a art museum, something where, vi where, where the, visual, um, uh, the visual impact of that which you're conveying sort of speaks for itself, a 360 degree photo may be sufficient. But if it is a historic site, a place where interpretation may uh, require more articulation on, the, on behalf of uh, an interpreter, uh, a docent, a director of education, you might want to think about deploying 360 degree video. I will now show you two use cases of these technologies, one of which is a 360 degree picture and another of which is a 360 degree video. Um, both of these technologies can be published absolutely free. So if you go out there into the market and you buy a consumer grade VR uh, camera, uh, I've listed three here that we like, the Insta360, the Ricoh Theta, and the Garmin Verb. The, they range in price points from $250 to $700. You could go onto Amazon, buy one today. If you're a Prime member, it'll be in your inbox in two days at no, uh, you know, at no additional charge. You could take those 360 degree photos or videos same day and then upload them to free publication platforms such as YouTube 360, Facebook, Vimeo at no charge, right? It's like, it's incredibly simple. Um, so for example, let me show you now uh, the Guggenheim Museum, which uh, facilitates a 360 degree tour. So if you were an art museum, it now becomes very simple to imagine what this experience is like. So you could take these 360 degree photos. In this case, we're now at the top of the Guggenheim in New York City on Fifth Avenue. Um, and then you can upload these photos onto Google and then you can allow people- Andrew, to... sorry, Andrew. So yeah. I, I cannot see it on my screen. I don't know if everybody Thank thinks you. my screen is still- Let me, Thank you for telling me. Let me share my desktop. There we go, is that better? There we go. Is that good, Heat? Yes. Okay, so again, so here is the view from the top of the, of the Guggenheim. Um, and, uh, and so now uh, you can actually stitch together 360 degree photos and move through this environment. So again, in any specific 360 degree photo, you cannot walk through that physical environment. But if you have the capability of taking multiple 360 degree photos, you can publish them to, uh, you know, to Google's platform and then simply allow people the ability to have a virtual tour of your institution. Now, if you also want to enhance interpretation, you can create 360 degree videos. So what you would do in this case. Hi. Welcome to Thomas Edison National Historical Park. I'm glad you. So here we are now at Thomas Edison National Historic Park. This is again, just a 360 degree still image. You cannot physically move through the environment, but you're gonna experience a National Park Service Ranger interpreting the physical environment. You can join me here in Edison's library, or some refer to it as his office. He spent a lot of time here in West Orange, arrived here in 1887, spent the rest of his life till he passed away in 1931. He did a lot of work here at his desk, and as you take a look at it, you can see there's a lot of papers and a lot of books. His library had over 10. So again, all you have to do is get access to a 360 degree camera and have uh, somebody from your staff uh, record this content, and then you can upload it onto YouTube 360. Um, the, the, the benefit of YouTube, of course, is that it also has what we would call a Google Cardboard application. So if people are consuming it on the YouTube app on their smartphone and they have a piece of cardboard, then they can simply put the smartphone into the cardboard and it becomes uh, a virtual reality uh, device. So when you think about these 360 degree pictures and these 360 degree videos uh, that you may be publishing, uh, there are a few things that you should think about um, or some tips that we've aggregated uh, over the time with regards to how, you, how context and meaning are different for unique environments, right? So for a historic site, a place like Edison's Library, it's very different from say a public land. So if you're a public land, maybe it's more important to simply allow people to explore the park or to um, take advantage of the fact that you don't have 
uh, individuals impacting the natural habitat, um, uh, the flora, the fauna, et cetera. And you can actually take these cameras and, and provide more intimate experiences than if people were even able to come to your park to provide access where it would otherwise not be able. Um, or if you have uh, taken photos over time, or you wanna reach out to your community and crowdsource 360 degree photos, you can also visualize alternate seasons. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of the time that we're in is that people are feeling incredibly generous. So even if you're a public land and you don't even have access to a 360 degree photo, reaching out to your community on social, asking people who've taken those 360 degree photos to circulate them with you will allow you to uh, aggregate a breadth of visual content that you might be relatively limited in your ability to capture today. If you're a historic site, uh, you know, typically what we find from um, our, our, our users and our partners is that it's really about feeling the grandeur of what makes that place important. Um, and then in certain instances, also engaging up close and personal with historically important artifacts. Uh, so if you are at Constitution Hall, you know, moving on the other side of the velvet rope or the banister and, and really experiencing parts of the, uh, of the actual uh, hall that you can't physically walk on when you're there with an MPS Ranger, it's really nice to be able to do that because, it, you know, you have access to these parts of your institution. You can set up a 360 degree camera wherever you want. Um, and then also, if you're a museum, you know, people oftentimes get frustrated at their inability to get behind the casings and explore these artifacts. Uh, you can even uh, take many photos of a specific artifact and then use a simple uh, technology called photogrammetry, which we can also talk about if that comes up in Q&A, to create these augmented reality models uh, and simply using your camera and then upload those augmented reality models into your 360 degree environment. So again, people are able to get up close and personal with uh, artifacts that are otherwise inaccessible to them. I think the overwhelming sentiment though that we have, uh, that we feel and that we have learned from people out in the community is that people are stuck at home um, and they're really bored and they're really frustrated and their daily lives have been dramatically interrupted. So you have people who come to your institution all the time. You have members, you have school groups, you have people who are coming in as tourists. That connective tissue has now been severed. Anything that you do is a dramatic improvement uh, to what people are uh, experiencing today. And so you should take advantage of that. You should take advantage of the fact that everybody is at home and, um, and feeling a little bit more forgiving. So maybe you've been hesitant to try VR, but uh, maybe now's the time to sort of dip your toe in the water, take some 360 photos, you know, take one of your, uh, you know, docents and put them in front of a 360 camera and put it out there and aggregate feedback from your community. Anything that you do is going to provide connective tissue. It's going to distract people at home for five, 10, or 15 minutes. It's a really great opportunity to engage with your community uh, with reasonably low stakes. Um, but again, you know, when we're talking about context and meaning, it's not just about visualizing these places. There are also things that you can do um, to enhance the interpretive value of these experiences simply beyond what Google and Facebook have shown you. And it's really about, um, thinking through how you can deliver the programming that you do on site in a scaled and portable virtual environment. So this is an example of thinking about the things that you do well and doubling down on them. For example, if you know that you're gonna have 25,000 school students coming through in April and May, and they're all coming to visualize a, uh, a, a temporary exhibition that you have, Think through the educational planning, the interpretation panels that you've already put together, and then how those may port into a virtual environment. Um, and then we'll show you some examples now of how that could actually be done. So in the examples of 360 degree photos, what you could do is then overlay an interactive interpretive elements to help people um, learn more, right? So you could be overlaying photo, you could overlay uh, voiceover audio or primary source audio, um, you could scan other primary sources and embed those inside of the environment. You could also, again, take 360 degree video and dabble with a little bit of CGI to create alternative visual impact, um, especially the 360 degree interactive picture. This is something that you can do quickly, and it's the kind of thing that you can um, uh, do to dramatically enhance the overall quality of the experience for the user. 
And there are great off the shelf tools if you're brave enough that you can utilize to build these kinds of interactive experiences. Personally at Time Looper, if you're not gonna work with us, you know, we're, we, we really like Pano2 VR uh, as the best sort of commercial level uh, product that you could use to facilitate these interactive tours. Um, but one of the things that we'll talk about later is we're offering everything that we do for free. So we're also able to help you develop these interactive experiences uh, on your behalf. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna send it back to Yeet so he can show you how this enhanced interactivity can look inside of these VR experiences. I'm going to show three different experiences. The first one is from California, East Bay, uh, East Bay Regional Parks. So they took this, this 360 picture and then they sent us this picture and then they also told us they shared their interpretive content with us. And then on this picture, they highlighted where they want to display that information. And then here's the output. Pleasanton Ridge Regional Park's open space protects land that is vital for the plants and animals who make a home on these hillsides. Bountiful wildflowers can be found. As urban areas around regional parks expand, plants and animals seek out new habitats. Urban All right, uh, now this was an outdoor example. Next, I'm going to show an indoor example. And um, this one is from Ford's Theater in Washington, DC, the Peterson House experience. Um, uh, this is where uh, Lincoln was assassinated and then he was moved to this house, Peterson's house right across the street. So this indoor house, what we did was we went and then took the 360 pictures. And then here, the interpretive uh, interactive content is about the people who were in that room on that day. Based on their accounts, we created this experience. This it's the same technique, just a different uh, creative storytelling. I inquired where Miss Lincoln was and was informed that she was in the front parlor. I entered the parlor and found her there entirely alone. She was standing by a marble top table. In After the president died, Dr. Gurley went to Mrs. Lincoln and told her, The President is dead. Oh, why, why did you not... Why did you not come to me last night, Elizabeth? I sent for you, Mrs. Lincoln asked in a low whisper. I... All right. The next example, so this was a 360 image with interactive overlay. Um, the next one is a movie. Um, from Washington, uh, from New York, so the Federal Hall. Federal Hall is right across the New York Stock Exchange, and um, they want to break National Park Service want to bring the history to life in full. And then here's the output. It has been such an exciting spring. Our new nation's first electoral college has selected Revolutionary War General George Washington to be its first president. Rumor and notice of our war hero's pending arrival to New York City, now our nation's capital, has... Thank you, Yeet. Um... Uh, there is a question. Uh, Sarah asked, we brought up Pano 2 VR and Time Looper. Is there a fee associated with these or are they free? If there is a fee, what is the cost for a program like this? Uh, Sarah, good question. For Pano 2 VR, it's been a while since I have used it. Uh, the last time I looked, it was about $100, uh, but it's been a while. Uh, Time Looper, uh, 
with regard to Time Looper, we're offering we're offering all of our services for free for the duration of the uh, COVID nineteen crisis. So that includes all of the content development, the hosting, the publishing as well. And then after the crisis ends, depending upon um, whenever that is, uh, depending upon the breadth of the content experience that you create, uh, hosting fees, you know, uh, and licensing range from three to four hundred dollars uh, a month and up from there. Um, so now I'm going to, uh, oh, another question. Oh, uh, Pano 2 VR. Thanks, Charity. Uh, Pano 2 VR now lists $169, uh, per user. Uh, so, um, not too expensive. And again, it makes a huge difference. So just creating that single, uh, type of interactivity, uh, dramatically enhances customer experience and retention. We've seen that, you know, 360 degree photos relative to interactivity people are likely to spend three times as long in an interactive photo environment rather than just with a 360 degree photo. Um, and so it really provides for a much more compelling experience. Now, just to hammer home the point that I mentioned before with regards to how you're going to build into a uh, Pano environment, um, you already have all of this content. So for example, if you're the Henry Ford and you have this scavenger hunt that people are taking when they come into your institution, take that content and you know where the points are within your institution where people should be scavenging for various point, uh, visual cues, you can then take you know, a, um, an interpretive ranger and put them in the virtual environment and then ask people to find key interactive elements within the museum. So just take the interpretive content that you have and deploy it into your virtual tour and find something that's relatively easy to do, find something where you know there is a known constituency, and then develop it for them, and then work to actually push it out to them, and then get their feedback, and then build from there. In this kind of environment, the name of the game is speed, um, and then you'll learn and iterate quickly, um, and so that's probably what we would, we would recommend rather than uh, going for comprehensive at first. Um, and then, Everything that we've been talking about really is about individual isolated experiences, but your museum or your historic site or your public land or your zoo is about more than the sum of its parts. So one of the other things that you could do is integrate all of these different pieces of content onto a virtual map. So imagine putting all of the different uh, pieces of virtual content within your uh, experience, within your institution onto a single virtual platform. The real value of that is that VR is an inherently visual medium, and that visual medium requires context in many cases in order for people to be able to fully appreciate uh, the point of view that you're providing to them. Imagine walking on the south rim of the Grand Canyon and not being able to actually see the full Grand Canyon before you dive into one of these virtual experiences. Uh, so here at Time Looper, we're also offering the ability for us to take all of your content and publish one of these virtual maps that people could then either walk on with a tablet or a smartphone um, and then trigger these individual VR experiences from within that map. So I'm now again going to uh, send it back to Yeet, who's going to take you uh, on a journey uh, through a walkable map in Japan. Right, in this example, first I'm going to show you how it works and then I'm going to use, share my screen on my iPad. First, uh, let me find the camera, All right. So it is, this is the map. And then as you can see, it is 360 degrees, but also I can walk inside this map and get closer to everything. So now, to give you a clear view, I'm sharing, I'm going to share my screen. So this project was created for Japan Tourism Association to promote different neighborhoods of the city. Here's how it looks. Now, um, after starting it, I'm gonna start walking inside this space. Shimonoseki is a city with many stories to tell to her visitors. In some such stories, Shimonoseki played a supporting role. In others, she was the main actor, changing the course of history for the entirety of Japan. To hear her stories, 
and witness her history unfold, start exploring by walking on the virtual map. Town might be most famous for its gardens, ancient temples, and its glamorous beauty, but she has more to tell. All right, here's a question. Uh, would a museum be able to have a virtual map of their building and grounds? or does it need to be a land-based geographic map? Um, so the answer is yes, um, it can be both. Um, the advantage of the landscape, land and landscape, is that map is already available. So it's in, in 24 hours, it can go live. For the building itself, um, if the 3D model already exists somewhere, somehow, then it, if it is not 24 hours, depending on the details of the 3D model, it can be like maybe a week to go live with a similar experience. Um, but if we have to do build everything from scratch, then and then pay attention to every single detail, it may be like a month or two. It's depending on what's available. Just to give you a quick example, um, right now um, we are, there's a project with uh, Redwood Forest, and it's, it's a land base, obviously, but, and then they created 360 content, already they have this content for a specific tree, and then they, they discovered that there's a life in different heights of the tree. But they do not want to show, tell people, show people on the map where this tree is. It's very sensitive, it's under protection. So on this map, we are going to be, we're, we're going to use a 3D model of a tree, which is going to be not complicated to build. And then we are gonna attach content of the different heights of the tree. So they have a similar challenge that you have and there, there are ways to solve for it. It's, it's all goes back to the available 3D model of the house or do we have to build it from scratch? And it can vary from um, seven days to a, a month or two. Another way to think about possibly solving this is to think about rather than utilizing your museum as the basis for the map, using a map that centers around an interpretive journey that you want to tell. So if you are a, uh, a Jewish history museum and you, uh, uh, and you don't, and, and a map of you know, Milwaukee is not the most relevant thing, you might want to, for example, uh, talk about uh, if you were to use the Holocaust, you could take a map of Europe. Um, and then tell the story of, you know, 1940 on that map and then create an interpretive journey that's not visually based upon your physical museum itself, but on an interpretive journey that you're quickly creating and publishing for your community. Um, so that's another yeah. one. That. Yeah, and also if, like, if you're a museum with artifacts, then you can place all those artifacts to their original locations so that people, instead of walking inside your corridors, people will be walking on the map to and visit those artifacts in their original places. Exactly. Um, but, you know, everything that we've been talking about so far is in some ways it's on demand content. So the idea is that you're going to create it and you're going to publish it and then people can consume it. Uh, but uh, one of the most powerful features of virtual reality in our opinion is also the ability to co-locate people in experiences and to share those virtual environments. So you have people who are all stuck at home, um, and if they have children, those children are actually now undertaking distance-based digital learning. So you know where they used to go to school every day, now they're on Zoom or on Google Classrooms with their teachers. You can actually deploy these virtual environments and then take those school groups that were otherwise going to be coming to your institution in April and May and meet them in your virtual environment and facilitate tours. The tour guide or the uh, head or the education team uh, can, uh, can meet these students who, you know, maybe there are 25 students from a class. They're all joining your museum or your historic site, your public land, your map 
from their homes and then your tour guide is uh, leading that virtual experience. And you know you would be delivering all of the same interpretive educational content that you would otherwise be develop, uh, delivering on-site in person. Now, one of the challenges of VR conferencing is that it's not scalable, right? Whereas everything else is downloadable, what you could do with VR conferencing though is you could actually record the, the facilitated VR conference session publish that and then turn that into an additional on-demand piece of content. So another way to think then about the development of the map that you will be creating is think of it as a flexible platform where you can deliver multiple types of VR conferencing interpretive programming, record those, publish those, and then allow people to also watch those on demand. So I make an addition. Yep. Uh, so usually we get we get a lot of questions in terms of how can I monetize this um, later on if not today. Um, that's a great tool. So what you can do is for you, this same experience can be downloadable where it's just self-explored, but then you can run special sessions uh, in v, through via VR conferencing, and then you may charge for those sessions. That is also get, provides you additional revenue. We have seen, so we've discussed a lot of different tools today, everything, you know, from a 360 degree photo to cinematic VR to, uh, you know, uh, platforms for VR conferencing, you know, in, uh, to some extent, speed is the name of the game. Uh, and so what we would recommend is sort of starting with those tools that you can deploy as quick, you know, very quickly. So 360 photo, 360 video, 360 interactive picture, um, when you determine that you are ready to go and you have your interpretive uh, assets all lined up, these products can get built and launched, you know, in anywhere from 48 to 96 hours. So it all can be done very quickly. And the interactive map is the same sort of thing that could be sort of pump, uh, built and that content can be embedded and deployed within a week. Um, there are things like the 360 degree picture, which can be deployed in a couple of hours or a 360 degree movie, which might take a couple of months, but those two products either don't enhance interpretation or have a sufficiently long gestation period uh, that they probably are not the kinds of tools that we would recommend prioritizing initially. So if you develop your 360 degree photo or your interactive video, uh, your interactive photos or your 360 videos with your interpreters in your institution, then it's a question of how do you get it out quickly? And we always like to joke that this isn't field of dreams. So you can't just build it and then expect people to use it. Like any other piece of programming within your museum or your institution, you should think about where and how you're gonna market it. Uh, the, uh, the example on the left is Concord Hills Regional Park, which is a partner of ours. When you go to the website, it tells you that the park is closed, but download this virtual reality tour. On the left is an example from Pearl Harbor where they use social media. Uh, but even more effective than that, I think, is the digital uh, direct outreach to, uh, to your key stakeholders. So again, if you're developing a virtual uh, tour around a, uh, a piece of curriculum that you know is gonna be heavily used this spring by schools, email those schools, those teachers that will be bringing people into your doors and say to them, hey, look, we know that your students can't leave home, but in absence of that, utilize this tool, which we're making available to you. So that way you can have a facsimile of what that onsite experience could be like. Um, and then that way that will dramatically drive up usage. So with all of that, uh, you know, just a couple of best practices that we sort of want to reiterate uh, as we wrap up, you know, how to build these tours very quickly. So the first of which is find a partner uh, publishing platform that keeps their platforms updated. The National Park Service built a wonderful app for the National Mall. And then three months later, Apple pushed out a software update. And that app never worked again after NPS had spent all that money on that app for the mall. So whether it's Time Looper or Google or Facebook, you can be assured that they're going to constantly uh, work on the back end to uh, ensure future compatibility with hardware. As I mentioned before, start with enough to be substantive, so maybe three to five distinct experiences but don't worry about being comprehensive. Push it out there, utilize the fact that you need to be quick to get feedback from your community and find out that which you've created, uh, if it's impactful, if it's valuable, where, um, where people would like to see you uh, develop new pieces of content. And then you could also push these things out serially. 
uh, at least where I am here on the East Coast, I have a feeling I'm going to be stuck at home through mid-May, maybe even into June. It would be really great if, if the institutions that my children have deep interest in are continuously publishing content, you know, just like Netflix does or just like, um, you know, HBO does, where every week there's a new series of content that gets pushed out. It's a really great way not just to engage with your visitors once, but to continuously over time. Um, again, we also think that you should recommend, we, we recommend starting with a specific audience in mind. Don't just capture a 360 photo and then think about what to do with it. Think about your audience and consider what it is that they would find most visually relevant or interesting or where the interpretive value is for that audience and then build your content around that. If you don't know how to do that, reach out to us. We're happy to think, help you think through this stuff. Uh, this is what we do for a living. Um, but I, somehow I have a feeling that you sort of know where your sweet spot is. Um, and then again, you don't need a headset. Start quickly, fail quickly, iterate from there, um, and you'll be off to the races in no time. Now, I am aware that for some of you, the idea of taking these 360 photos and creating interactivity is a, is seems a bit daunting. Um, but for some of you, it's exactly the kind of thing that you're ready to try. Uh, for those of you who are ready to try, we've got all of these resources that, you know, that, that we've made available, uh, the links that we think are most helpful to helping you do all of these self-publication. But if you do want help, we are providing all of our products and services to all of our existing and potential partners at absolutely no cost for the duration of the COVID crisis. Um, so that's uh, everything from uh, content development. So if you send us 360 degree photos, we're happy to create uh, these interactive uh, visuals inside of those environments to uh, deploying that on the Time Looper platform so people can have one click download to access it on their tablets, on their smartphones, etc. cetera, uh, to the walkable maps uh, and the VR conferencing and tour functionality. I mean, like there's no catch here. What we're trying to do is help you get your museums up and running. Um, and we know it's a difficult time for everybody. And so we're making all of our resources available to the entire museum public land and historic site community um, to help you in any way that we can. Um, if you want more information on how to work with us, again, you can find it on this next page. Uh, but the other thing is you can just go to the Time Looper page and up in the top, you'll see a bright red link to COVID-19 and it explains what we're calling the Time Looper Foundations Program, all of the things that we're giving away for free um, to see if you can make use of them. If you don't wanna make use of them and you have questions about how you can do it by yourself, I've spent countless hours fighting with uh, Google, uh, you know, for, for Street View and for Google uh, institutions and then Facebook 360. So rather than trying to beat your head against the table, just reach out to us and ask us the questions and we're happy to help. Um, so we covered a lot of ground in terms of different ways in which you could create content, different types of interpretive methods, how to port your existing institution into 360 environments. Uh, we're more than happy to stay on and answer as many questions as you all have. Uh, the Q&A uh, Q link is you know, in that black bar. Just feel free to chat along some questions and uh, we'll start answering. Uh, or you can follow up with us offline. So any questions? Okay. Um, well, if there are no questions, I am now going to pass it back to Charity. Oh, here's a question. All right. Um, here it is. I think this is great what you guys are doing. We're on a very tight budget. Once you guys help us during this time, do we then have to continue with Time Looper and pay the $300 plus to keep it up? Or can you help us get started and then we keep it up and contact you when we need more updates? for a new project? Great question, Sarah. Um, so the way that interactivity gets built for any VR program is it is unique to the platform that you're building it into. So if you're gonna work with Time Looper to embed this interactivity into experiences with Time Looper using our software and services, you can't then take that and port that somewhere else. Um, same with Pano2 VR. If you use Pano2 VR, you're sort of locked into using their technology for the duration. Um, so one of the things that you could do is you could work with us and you know it would cost you nothing 
and we would help build it. And then um, if at the end of, you know, COVID, which, you know, we'll at least go through the summer, if uh, you feel like there's value there, then you could either determine where to go to find those resources, or then maybe go through the effort of, learn how, of learning how to build it in Pano2 VR or in another platform that might have a lower monthly licensing cost. Um, but you know, your 360 photos that you take or your 360 videos that you take you know, are obviously yours. So even if you just wanna take your 360 videos and upload them into Time Looper's map or up into Time Looper's platform, you own those and you can do whatever it is that you want with those after the, uh, after the crisis has ended. Uh, so yeah, and, and also related to that, so one of most of our partners are, if once they build, they start with minimum budget um, and then they build these experiences and then use this for fundraising, whether through different um, grants or through their donor base. So this is going to be a great asset for you to, after the crisis, maybe apply for grants to keep you alive, to add more content. Because once you have something, it is much easier to find that money to grow it. And so once we build it, it's not going to disappear. So you can always use it for future fundraising uh, purposes. Or uh -huh. use it as need based it from time to time. So uh, then, uh, Sarah, did that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, and then Ava Rodriguez from the Holden Arboretum asked for our contact information. It's here. It will also be um, shared with you uh, through all of the um, materials after the fact. You can also find us on our uh, website, of course, timelooper.com. So uh, I, uh, if there are, and not any other questions, we're coming up on noon, but of course we're happy to stay. Uh, I'm now gonna pass it back to Charity. Uh, and allow her a few parting words. So, Charity, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew uh, and Yeet. I really appreciate the presentation today. I hope everybody else um, gleaned a lot of great advice from it. I wanted to highlight a few things that stood out to me that you repeated over and over again that I think are very important. As an experienced planner myself, um, you offered great advice about focusing on the immediate needs of key audiences right now. And I think that's great advice for all of us who are trying to uh, kind of dig through sort of the growing list of things that we could be doing or need to be doing right now um, to help others. I think it's important to focus on those key audiences as well. Uh, I also appreciate the um, recommendation for any, you know, any of the, uh, museums and cultural organizations considering this to think of it as an iterative design process that you might start with one and, and learn from that, um, apply that those lessons learned to the next one and, and sort of a more rapid process that way. It's it's prototyping essentially and that's okay. Uh, I think you're doing your part to try to provide for the needs of others uh, in your communities and your audiences. So um, I think that they'll be happy with anything you're trying to do um, to make access possible right now and to, to grow and build on that is a great thing. Um, I also wanted to thank you, Andrew and Eat uh, and the group at Time Looper for offering free services right now. I think um, it's really great to have companies like yours, uh, partners of AMM and uh, members of our network offering things like this to help others out, even if it's temporary. Um, it's it's a it's a big deal, and I want to encourage those of you who are considering working with Time Looper or others, no matter what platform you go with, um, know that it's important that you have a good team to support you with your technology needs. So whatever you do, um, getting it out there, you're going to want to be able to maintain it over time and 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 work with folks you trust. So that's all I would say. Um, thanks again. I really appreciate this. Learned a lot today, uh, and I'm happy to. Um, help you Andrew in communicating sort of FAQs uh, on our website along with the recording as well. Great thanks Charity and again these resources will be up on Time Looper's website in a couple of hours um, and Charity uh, will distribute them as she normally does 